A big welcome again, um, and welcome to our lunch session. Um, for the panel today, we have, first of all, uh, Bruce, who you already know. And I want to invite Bruce to the stage. Um, he's currently the chair of the Community Giving Board of the uh, Directors and also a fund holder. Uh, he's been active in the Alexandria area, having served on several nonprofit boards in the community, including Legacy of Lakers Museum and uh, the Douglas County Car Care. And Bruce is going to tell us a little bit more about himself. And then I'd also like to introduce Brenda Jennison. And Brenda Jennison is the president and CEO of Felt Feeling Trailers in Sock Center, Minnesota, and volunteers her time supporting a number of local organizations, including the Fitness Playground, Holy Family School, and the Junior Achievement. Um, Brenda's also going to tell you a little bit more about herself. And then the final person is uh, Paul Buckby. And uh, Paul is the third generation resort resort owner, operator of Bug Bee Hive Resort Lodge and Event Center in, um, on B, I Be beautiful. Be beautiful. You'll never forget that. <laughs> And welcome uh, to our session as well. Um, I'm going to ask each of you if you would just start by telling um, the audience a little bit more about yourself, a um, little bit about your family life, um, your career, and uh, what brought you um, to your local community <coughs> foundation. How did you discover your own local community foundation? Do you want to start? <coughs> um, yeah, I'm Paul Bikeby. Um, did I use your chair to put my Pepsi on? <laughs> you want to sit there? <laughs> uh, so I'm from Painesville, Minnesota. I'll make it as brief as I can. But uh, I'm, a, as you indicated, a third generation resort owner of the Bikeby High Resort. This year we'll celebrate our, our 100 year anniversary, which uh, is amazing to me. Um, but I. Uh, after I finished college, I just came back to the resort. My plan was always to go into, to come back to the resort, run the resort. And um, so I leased the resort for my folks. And uh, they, they, my dad and his dad had full-time jobs beyond the resort. And uh, so the first year I leased it, I thought, well, this is great. I'm living at home, you know, mom and dad's house, didn't have any expenses. The lease was pretty, pretty uh, low. And, uh, but they were like, get out and get another job. You gotta have another job if you want to resort. And I'm like, nah, I'm just doing fine. This is great. And, uh, so at the end of that first year, they really hiked the lease up. <laughs> they effectively moved me out. And, uh, so I answered a, a, a job ad with the American Heart Association. And uh, I never thought I'd be working for another company, so to speak, but I started working with the American Heart Association, and uh, found that it was really a very fulfilling and uh, rewarding uh, career, so to speak, uh, fund development. And uh, so I worked with the American Heart Association for eight years, and then I came down to St. Cloud and worked at St. Benedict Center, a senior community out here in Southeast St. Cloud for another 10 years, starting up their development program. So that's how I kind of got into fundraising and into uh, the development field, you know, the, the bank business or fundraising or development, depends on what, who's talking to who here. But uh, it, it, it's always been a great experience for me and a very, as I say, rewarding experience. So when I did go back to the Bucky Eye Resort, um, I wanted to become involved with the community and with the civic activities there and uh, got involved, uh, well, actually at the time, sorry, wait, but at the time, uh, the city was looking at trying to form a, uh, uh, a community foundation and it kind of explored different ways. And they visited with me a little bit and some other council people. I wasn't on the council, but other people. Uh, and we talked about this. But it wasn't until about uh, 13, 14 years ago that uh, some of my colleagues who are here now 
uh, uh, we got together and said, let's, let's try to make this community foundation go. And so we really put our minds and hearts to it and we made it happen. So that's my experience, uh, just introductory to community foundations. My wife is here, I have a daughter who's uh, not, not in the Twin Cities, working in the hospitality field for a competitor of mine, a small resort called Madden's Resort. <laughs> and, uh, and I have a son at the Buckley Ave Resort who's uh, worked for a great organization, Buckley Ave Resort. So, thank you. So, Brenda Fenling Jennison. Um, I'm married to my husband Patrick. We have three daughters, ages 8, 10, and 12, and we're welcoming our second. Uh, exchange daughter at the end of December. So we just found out last week and kind of a whirlwind week. Um, born and raised in South Central Minnesota and went away to college uh, to the University of St. Thomas. Go Tommies in St. Ben's world. Um, <laughs> um, and then uh, after about 10 years came back to uh, purchase the family business and, and take that over with my sister and my husband and brother-in-law also work there. So the four of us uh, own and operate that now. So there are women in manufacturing. Um, and then four years ago, there were some community leaders in Sox Center who had long amongst themselves discussed about having a community foundation in Sox Center and the need for it. And someone uh, by the name of Sarah Carlson, Wilmer Area Community Foundation's executive director, moved to Sox Center. And so those conversations became more frequent. And I was invited to the table as well and learned more about community foundations and the work and purpose, and I was all in. Um, so we were able to form that foundation in November of 2015. And I'm past chair and now a treasurer of our community foundation up there. And then also joined Community Givings Board last year. Well, I'm originally from Richmond, Virginia. <laughs> Although I've lost most of that accent after all these years in Minnesota. <laughs> uh, I will tell you some things about Alexandria. Uh, through my nonprofit involvement in other than uh, the Community Foundation, uh, we have two remarkable museums in Alexandria. The Runestone Museum, which is our older museum that, that houses the Kensington Runestone. Now, uh, this is a stone, if you don't know about it, that uh, says something like, um, well, I don't know, we, we are uh, 12 Norwegians and two Swedes, and we left two men at our camp and we went exploring and we came back and they were red with blood, Ave Maria. That's probably a pretty poor recollection, but that's, that's my recollection of it. <clears throat> Written in Norse runic writings. Neighboring museum, immediately adjacent, is the Legacy of the Lakes Museum, uh, where I'm on the board of that museum. And uh, we are one of count them on one hand, the number of high, high quality classic wood boat museums in the nation. And we have a variety of resort paraphernalia from the local Alexandria area. Uh, last season we had an extraordinary uh, exhibit uh, with some help from a, a generous donor and brainer of uh, race boats from the classic race boat era, uh, classic wood race boats of the 1920s. And then I'll tell you about one other nonprofit that actually that I'm involved with that Jim Roloffs asked me about this morning. <clears throat> it is called Car Care. Uh, this nonprofit literally eliminates unemployment one car at a time. And what we do at Car Care, by the way, we just recently expanded from Douglas County to added Pope County uh, to immediately to our south. We both repair and gift cars to people who qualify. These cars are donated, and uh, most of our repair is done by volunteer mechanics. The typical recipient of a car is a 
single mom with small kids, and you can absolutely 100% count on the fact that that mom starts a job as soon as she receives the car. In a few instances, the mom also goes back to school, but always they start the job. And th this is an extraordinary thing that's been going on for uh, half a dozen years now in, in Douglas County. And um, with the expansion into Polk County, we're receiving, uh, of course, uh, a, a big uh, welcome because they have the same need. Uh, the further you get uh, into rural Minnesota, uh, the worse the transportation problems are. So car care is, uh, well, it's like community giving. It's very scalable. OK. So why is your local community foundation important? Um, and why did you start working with the local foundation as opposed to having a donor advice fund with a commercial entity like uh, Fidelity? Why the local? I'm going to start with uh, Brenda. Sure. So the reason why my husband and I chose to have a donor advice fund at our Saxon Area Community Foundation was the fact that our executive director had a connection to the community. Um, she lives there. She knows what's going on and has a pulse to our community. So she's hearing things from the school and other, maybe where the gaps are, if you will. Um, we can have conversations with her when we run into her or uh, for example, Pat and I were talking just about the need for financial literacy at a younger age. I think that's why we often in society, and I'm generalizing here, but we maybe do have issues with credit card debt and um, you know, people thinking that I can't afford this or that and I'm, I'm living paycheck to paycheck and well it shouldn't be that way if, if you know how to budget and you live within your means and all of those things. So we were having this conversation and Sarah said, well, have you heard of Junior Achievement? Pat and I looked at each other, no, what's that? So she filled us in, and if you don't know, it's basically um, volunteers that come into the classroom in a school setting, and they offer it kindergarten through 12th grade, but they touch on various financial literacy subjects, and they look at communities and what makes a community tick. Everything from your banks, your businesses, your volunteers, so a plethora of it and then they also do budgeting um, they have a class where you can kind of run the city they have a biz town that's called down in st paul and kids can actually have a checkbook have a job and then it's up to them to spend the money that they earn um, to pay the bills to make a profit at the business that they're working at um, and then also to donate or get that social aspect so anyway when we heard about it we were sold and said let's bring it to sock center um, and when I'm not one to suggest things and have other people do it, um, I get involved. And so Pat and I um, did our research, we brought it to Sox Center and instituted it. One of the elementary schools was right away on board. So we did that K through six at that school. And then last year we were able to do it K through four as well. Um, so just showing that it, it's making an impact locally. They know what is needed locally. Um, another aspect of that is, is she's able to, you know, we want to know what the pulse is, if you will, from other people and she can let us know like, hey, have you heard about this or that? So that's that's why we chose to start one in our local community. How about you, Bruce? I think uh I think the best way to describe my interest in the uh, Community Foundation initially was really from a couple things that I learned about the Community Foundation immediately upon inquiring as to what it was. And the first was that the Community Foundation does not have a specific focus for its charitable work. 
unlike car care, for instance, which has to maintain its focus and stick to the knitting of, of the car <coughs> effort, the community foundation can and does operate to the benefit of any legitimate nonprofit in the community. And I like that. I like the fact that it, it uh, operated that way. As I came to understand it, I, I, I referred to the foundation when others would ask me what it is. I said, well, it's kind of a, an umbrella foundation. We can, we can go anywhere. The other thing that I really like about a community foundation is the aspect of the unrestricted fund. We hear an awful lot in our foundation world about donor advised funds. And these are important, and these are significant in, in aggregate dollars, certainly. But um, it's really the unrestricted funds that are the real juice for community foundation in, in that the uh, foundation board can uh, have grants that the board decides where the money should go because the board frequently is in tune with needs in the community that an individual donor may not be uh, simply aware of. And, and those are the two things that, that greatly interested me. How about you, Paul? Um, the, I, when I was working here in St. Cloud with St. Benedict Center, I was aware of the initiative fund, uh, and just towards the end of my tenure with St. Benedict Center, I became aware of the Central Minnesota Community Foundation. Sam Newman, I think, was the first uh, executive director of that. And I, so I guess I was aware of the community foundations, and when I went back to Paintsville, uh, I, was, I was aware that uh, some, some uh, women uh, who had never been married, uh, I don't know if they're called Spitzer women or whatever, but they, uh, they uh, had left, they had a sizable estate, and that money went somewhere else. It didn't stay in the community. And I think that's what really kind of prompted the city leaders to say, you know, really, we, might, we should have a community foundation here. And, uh, that's when, they, that's when I got involved in talking about trying to do a community foundation and what we could do. Um, so that, I guess that's where my involvement came, was just to, to, to focus on the community, trying to keep uh, people's donations, trying to keep, keep people's charitable intent with the local community. And, uh, and then I suggested that to my dad, and my dad set up a fund with the Central Minnesota Community Foundation, and he's trying to run from that. So, um, as a donor, what do you expect from your local foundation or charity? As a donor, do you want to start first? Sure. Um, what, I, what I hope to see in time as the assets of my local uh, community foundation grow is that we can take a lead in our community and initiate some things uh, right now, we are at a stage of about five million in assets, and our grants committee at, at this level of assets is is frankly simply reactive to local ap to applications from local nonprofits that we receive in our annual grants round. And what I'm really looking forward to is when our assets are 10, 15, or more million, when we can take a lead as some of our other partners here at Community Giving uh, have done and take a lead in the community and address a need that our board just says, you know, this is, we need to do this uh, for the betterment of the community and, and initiate something on our own. How about you, Brandon? Sure. Um, as a donor, what do you expect from your local foundation or charity? So I like to know what's needed um, rather than being asked just for a donation, if you will. Um, you know, what specifically will this be used for? Why is it important? Who will it impact? 
um, having those questions answered, I think, um, really allows a better connection to the various projects that are going on in the community. And it may even trigger something like, oh, so-and-so is really passionate about the arts, or so-and-so is really passionate about entrepreneurship and you know, helping <coughs> develop our leaders in our community. So really knowing what the donations are needed for and how it's gonna impact the community, I think is what I expect from our foundation. How about you, Pa? Thanks, I'll try that. Um, you know, I, one, of the, one of the, the number one rule I always cite in fundraising is, is, is people give to people. Um, it's who makes the ask. And so I don't necessarily think about the cause or the organization that we're raising the money for. That certainly is important. Um, but it's who makes the ask, you know, and when, when Leo Lewis comes to me and he says, how much are you in on this for? Well, I know I better be in for something because if, uh, if I have something that I'm passionate about, I'm going to be going to Leo. Um, so uh, Leo or Steve or whoever is with our, with, within our community. Um, but it's who makes that ask. And that's what gets me supportive of the cause or the organization that we have to be running, raising money for that year. On a broader perspective, I really like the fact that uh, I think of my dad's donor advice fund that we can contribute to that or add to that fund, and uh, and we as our as a family now can make a decision of where those dollars go. So that's that's the nice thing, and and our involvement from the Painter Community Foundation with the Central Minnesota Community Foundation is we can bring that message out to our community as well that hey you can support a variety of funds that you might be interested in in our community. Thank you. Um, what's the best thing your charity can do to support your giving? The best thing your charity can do to support your giving? <coughs> I thought it hurts now. Yeah. Right <laughs> um, you know, I think just the best thing that we can do is uh, provide options for people provide options for them as far as how they want their charitable gifts to be spent, uh, whether they want to set it up, their charitable gift in a donor advised, where they can make that determination of how it's going to be spent or can contribute to different uh, funds that already exist to support those funds. Um, and I think the other aspect is, is that they have a, a, a range of tools in how to donate that money, uh, whether it's just specifically to a cause that we might be raising money for at a specific gala uh, that we do annually in our town, or if they want to look at, look at or explore plan giving options or other types of, of avenues for, for donating. Uh, to have those tools uh, available for people to give it makes it easier to give. Brenda. Um, Brainer did a uh, uh, newspaper wrap and Wilmer did as well and now Sox Center is doing it in a couple of weeks um, and I love it it's a newspaper wrap um, and it there it is Carl's holding it up um, I when I saw it I said we got to do this it's fantastic because it gives a snapshot of what's happening at the foundation and like you mentioned there are so many different avenues to give not only the donor advice but if there's the general fund because obviously products come up and it's great to have that unrestricted money to use but this is a way to communicate how that money was used. And so then that builds trust in people to give unrestricted money, um, and then also to see all of the good that you're doing in the community. So I think effective communication is what I expect. Well, I certainly have to uh, agree with what's been said by each of you. I would just add one additional item, and that is, it is a key role of a community foundation to retain local philanthropic capital within its community so that that capital does not escape to Fidelity, Schwab, et cetera, where it may well not come back to the local community. So retention of local capital from philanthropically minded people, that's, that's really our juice. Now, we have a number of professional advisors in attendance today. 
What do you expect from your professional advisors with respect to supporting your charitable giving? Well, I immediately wanted to answer this because I remember so well some years ago attending my CG uh, orientation for new board members uh, day and listening to Steve Merway of St. Cloud. And I remember this so distinctly. Steve talked about how Laraway clients participate hugely in charitable gifting. I came up to Steve after the meeting and I said, how, how do you arrange this? How does it happen? He said, well, you know, I will have at least an annual meeting with each client. I put it on the agenda. So what do you put on the agenda? He said, charitable gifting. It's on the agenda for the meeting. And so then I said, well, Steve, how, like, how many of your clients will respond in this way? He, right away he says, 80%. So what I would like to see <laughs> is financial advisors putting it on the agenda for the client meeting. Um, I think it's also important to keep us abreast of tax law changes um, because as we know, it, they change a lot. And um, so just so that we know exactly what's happening um, out there with the tax laws and then can make some decisions um, based on that as well. Just br briefly, I think it's awareness. Uh, your community needs to know, your philanthropic people need to know that those avenues are there uh, for charitable giving. Uh, and those, that awareness certainly comes through their financial advisors, whether it's their attorneys or financial planners, uh, accountants or whomever. Um, we've hosted a couple financial planning type seminars with, with exclusive for our financial planners and attorneys in, in, in Painesville, uh, just to kind of remind them that these tools are available and that uh, it's a good thing to talk about with their clients. So, uh, Brenda, you mentioned taxes. What impact did the 2017 tax law have on you? And did it change the way you think about charitable giving? Um, from a bunching standpoint, yes. Um, from a gifting, you know, now rather than in some years, you know, making sure I print every check that's been cleared, um, I don't do that and, until those bunching years. Um, so and that has changed the behavior, but I still gift um, regardless to, you know, I, we do almost all of our gifting now out of our donor advised fund, but there are things, you know, throughout the year that we just write a check to, and, and um, like I said, then we don't print off the clear check, um, but on those bunching years, that is changing our behavior to make sure, okay, um, that we're doing that, but um, still trying to be very charitable. How about you, Paul? I wanted to skip this one. <laughs> um, I, I have to admit, I, I really don't think about the tax changes in the law and how it affects my uh, charitable giving. Um, it, it really doesn't. Um, I'll let my accountant work out the details as far as my tax returns go, but uh, whatever charitable gift site I give uh, because I want to give those and not necessarily motivated by taxes. How about you? Well, I'm in Paul's camp. I'm not running a business any longer. I'm long retired, so. I actually pay no, it has no effect on me. Okay, well, now I want to turn to our audience and ask are there any questions from the audience for this panel? Any questions from the audience? Raise your hand, we'll get a mic to you. Or you can come up here to this mic. Your most impactful gift that you've made that really has touched you and you feel really good about? Um, I get, you know, I guess for me, and I'm not sure it isn't through our community foundation, but um, uh, I get a little more so, but the last couple of years, uh, uh, I've been able to uh, fund a trip to uh, 
down through the Orphan Theater for a Broadway production, uh, and I uh, uh, host the bus and, and the tickets, and uh, this is one where Leo has helped out as well. But uh, it's just uh, it's something that I enjoy. I think theater is a is a great uh, thing, and the arts are great. And uh, I never really was exposed to it until I was in my thirties, and I'm like, uh, wouldn't this be great if these high school kids could be exposed to it? I'm just so thrilled with the uh, music program at our high school. And uh, so it's just something that I like to do and uh, I hope to set up uh, an endowment fund that it can continue to go on uh, when I can't do it anymore. Other questions from the audience or do either of you also have a response? Um, so I love giving from the heart. Um, my husband always wanted to go visit Yost Van Dyke I don't know if any of you know where that is, but it's a tiny little island in the British Virgin Islands. And we were fortunate enough to book a trip there. And then a hurricane hit. Um, and so we contacted our VRBO owner, and he was very understanding. And they had to do some repairs anyway. And we said, we'll come back the following year. But meanwhile, we heard about, because um, we followed them on social media, it's the pink house on, in Yosef Van Dyke. And um, we found out that there was a community foundation in North Carolina that was collecting funds to buy palm trees because all of the palm trees were wiped out from this hurricane. And it's an island in the Caribbean. They need palm trees. Um, and so we were lucky enough to make a grant to um, buy a palm tree. So fast forward to our trip and we were able to, uh, we were just walking one morning, me and a couple friends that we're on vacation with and we found our palm tree. So that was really cool to take a picture with it and um, see all the other palm trees on the beach. So it was fun. Uh, early this decade, my wife and I funded the construction of an eye hospital in Freetown, Sierra Leone. Uh, this is a small eye hospital that restores sight using the finest equipment, the same equipment that would be, would any, any eye surgery done here in St. Cloud can be done and is done in that clinic. Sierra Leone is, uh, <laughs> it, it's in a place on the continent that it's hard for us to imagine. This eye hospital is the only place you can go for any serious eye treatment of any type in an area of several countries totaling 40 million people. That really gets to you, doesn't it? Other questions from our audience? opportunity for us as community foundations to really differentiate ourselves on um, what is, is there a is there a message you remember that really resonated with you or is there a, a piece of wisdom that that you share because you think gosh if you guys would just start communicating this people would get what you do so where, where, I guess where's the differentiation opportunity that you see for us as community foundations from all of the other really great nonprofits that are also asking you um, to consider providing support I'll just quickly, I, it's, it's just so much about awareness. Uh, your local needs are, are more significant to your local community than the national and state and other types of appeals, which certainly have merit, but uh, the local needs are there. I don't think people are necessarily aware of the local needs. Uh, they know those organizations exist. Uh, and they may think that they're doing just fine, but every local cause, every local nonprofit uh, has needs. And to communicate that uh, is the best thing you can do. Yeah, I agree with that. The local impact and what that means locally um, really stands out for us. You know, and even within all of those, there's so many local needs too, um, and you can't do them all. And so from a corporate standpoint, um, we look at those that are most applicable to, to um, our industry 
And so like we're very heavy donate donors to our industrial technology program at our high school and robotics club and um, programs like that, um, our Western CEO program. Um, and then personally, it's just that impact again on, on locally and what's, what's gonna make the biggest bank, the impact for the buck. Additionally to what they just said, um, I think it's effective to cite a couple of recent donations from the foundation to local charities uh, because it is the awareness issue. Uh, that's, that's huge. Here's the thing about philanthropy that I have learned over the years. People who are philanthropically minded and it especially includes, well, it includes people with smaller means up to very vast, large means. If they want to give, they absolutely want to give. They just want to know who you are and what you stand for. And in a sense, the philanthropy for these folks is infinitely expandable. Just tell them who you are. Maybe I just tap on. Uh, I I think it goes beyond they want to give. I I'm I'm a big believer in uh, everybody wants to leave a legacy, and it doesn't matter what stage in life or economics they they are. Uh, everybody wants to be remembered and wants to leave a legacy. And, what better way, and that's, that's what I think we do, is we provide a legacy for the people in our communities. And we provide that through a, a, the tools and the means of, of giving back to the community. And what, what better legacy for, for, for every single person in your community. And when they feel that, when they see that, uh, their giving can be just infinite. Questions, other questions? Uh, I, I'm going to ask um, Carol to say just a couple words around this same question of how does the Community Foundation really distinguish itself and see if she can tell us a little bit about what CNCF has been doing lately to distinguish themselves. Well, some of you have already heard about uh, what we've been doing with the Get on the Bus project and I know that Wilmer recently started doing that as well. So. Um, we're trying to be more proactive with our donors now by giving them opportunities to learn about emerging needs. So what we do is twice a year, we work with United Way and we take our donor list and invite them all to get on the bus with us. And we pick one topic, one, one emerging need of our community. Um, just recently, we did it on, the well, last spring, we did it on ACES, Adverse Childhood Experiences. And so we had um, the hospital, Center Care, was on the bus with us first, and they talked about what adverse childhood experiences is and how that affects people throughout their adult lives uh, based on what traumatic things have happened to them. We then took them to the Child Advocacy Center and they learned about a program where when a child has experienced a traumatic event, they need, need to tell their story only one time because of the way that this nonprofit is set up and they have a great support system with it. Um, then we heard from Lion, which was an organization that helps young black men who are raised by single moms who have no male role model and helps them to build their self-esteem and helps them educationally so they have a chance of succeeding as an adult then. Um, we ended the evening by having a panel discussion then about other opportunities and the ability for donors to ask questions. What we found is that when we do the Get on the Bus event, a few things happen. Um, the donors learn about a need that they weren't aware of. They learn about solutions that are out there in the community that they may want to get behind. And they may get behind it by donating dollars, or they may choose to volunteer their time. Uh, they may become board members. Uh, some of them have connected the nonprofit with other entities that <coughs> help them to move their mission forward as well. So um, it's been a real positive experience. And the one thing that we found is um, when we started 
think our first bus we had about 35 people on it started to go down and we realized that what we were doing was when we took them on a bus to a nonprofit that they already knew about then they weren't as interested so when we changed to this emerging need our buses are now full and so it's been exciting our last one I think we had 46 the one before that we had 51 people attend so um, it's just a great way to to allow donors and I think it's a great way for us as community foundations to really show what does distinguish us from the larger entities is the fact that we have the ability to know what's going on in our community and we can share that out with our donors so they get that personal touch of actually learning and then making their own choice about what they want to do about it. Other questions? We're actually going to finish early then. Okay. That's great, they got a break. Well, uh, I would like to ask the uh, panelists, uh, before we go to break, uh, <coughs> if you'd be willing to just kind of hang out up here for a little bit. And what, what those in comments, new insights, or thoughts that you have that you <coughs> haven't shared already that you'd like to leave with this audience? Well, I, I'll try to be brief. Um, Again, some other just fundraising rules, tools, so to speak, that I picked up, and you're probably all aware of them, but, uh, you know, funds for promising programs, not to needy institutions. Uh, so all the things that you become involved with, uh, you know, if they aren't a promising program, make them a promising program. Uh, there are certainly a lot of needy institutions out there, needy charities, uh, help them build their promise, help them build what they are. And then the other just quote that I always really love is, uh, you know, a man, woman demonstrate their their full understanding of the meaning of life when they plant seeds for shade trees under which they'll never sit. And and that just so always resonates with me. I like to put it in every fundraising appeal that we send out. Um, that importance again of legacy, of doing something beyond yourself, doing something that's going to benefit your community and benefit future generations. So. Paul, you said it all. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, again, thank you for being here. This was beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to